Welcome to the Why Isn't It Working Business and Tech Podcast, talking all things business and tech in the emerging and enterprise space. Here are your hosts, Carl Wood and Michael Hamilton. Hi, and welcome to the podcast. Uh, today, we have Cameron Wall from Raincheck, which is an open uh, platform for commerce. How are you going there, Cameron? Yeah, good. Thanks for having me on. Cool. And hello, Carl. How are you today? I'm very well, Michael. I've uh, tried to progress outside for a bit of a change. So uh, welcome, Cameron. Thank you very much for joining the podcast today. Really appreciate your time. No worries. Beautiful day in Sydney, obviously. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Definitely. It's always a great day to be on the beaches. So um, Cameron, take us through um, rain check. So this is, you know, quite an interesting concept. I mean, we've got basically an online to offline platform, uh, commerce platform uh, where they can, so your retailers can track and influence, you know, product ordering, delivery, in-store sales um, and card linking as well. So this is really an interesting amalgamation. So how, how did this project start for you guys? Um. Well, I've had about six different tech ventures over the years, since the 90s, um, since the internet started. And during that time, I mean, mobile was, I, I, I switched off the web-based applications we were building into mobile quite heavily in about year 2000. Um, I could just see mobile exploding. A lot of people didn't at the time. It wasn't until the iPhone came out a few years later that that changed everything. But during 20. I think it was 2012, 2013, I was doing some work for Publicis Global um, Advertising Conglomerate and I was head of mobile for Asia Pacific. I was helping them out on some of their applications. And back then we were doing um, a lot of integration of CQ5, which was Adobe's product, which is now called Commerce Cloud, I think, um, with MasterCard and a few other big clients in APAC. And there's a whole team of guys doing uh, replatforming of e-com sites and um, I was talking to them one afternoon and having a look at some of the data and I noticed that uh, one of the data points I saw was the on a particular site that they were working on was the um, uh, shopping cart abandonment rates on the e-com site where it was 74 percent or something I said Jesus that's high and they said oh they're all like that and I said <laughs> they said oh they're all about 70 80 percent and I said but why is it so high and they said oh they had reasons like you know, people would get to check out and realise that the price was too expensive and abandoned or they would think that the shipping time's too long and they'd abandon. And I said, yeah, I get that, but it's there's no way to be that high. Like I was thinking 30 40% of people might, might do that. But So we got some funding together and ran some research and found out that what was happening was people were adding um, product items to shopping carts simply because they had no way of saving it. They weren't. They didn't want to buy it just then. They found a product, they discovered it, and they thought, oh, shit, I like that. I'll stick it in the cart because what do I do with it? I, don't, I need to come back. I might want to buy it in a week's time. I might want to go and look at it or something like that, especially in the apparel space. So I realised then, I thought, well, there's no, if everyone's doing that, that's ridiculous because why can't, why isn't there a universal wish list where you can just save these items to the cloud? Why do you, like most of the e-com sites would have a wish list function, but they weren't, or it wasn't universal. They weren't all put into the same bucket, if you like. Um, and even in the, during the research, we found out, especially women, women on their phones would leave the tabs open on these sites with the stuff in the carts. And then when they go shopping to Westfield, they pull all the tabs back up and have a look. At, you know, there's the blue top from Country Road. There's the. So we originally started building Rain Check as a wish list functionality. Um, and then it just blew out from there. We, um, that was great for the user. They had a wish list. But then the retail merchants wanted to know, okay, they discovered that product online. Six days later, they went to Westfield and did they purchase it? How do we know? So then it got us involved in the POS side, the payment side. I didn't really want to go back into payments, but we were dragged into it. Um, and then, you know, we were running basically an online to offline attribution model. So um, a brand might run a digital campaign, which a lot of people are doing. They spend a lot of their money on digital. They convert a user to the site. They have a look around the site. They discover a couple of products and then they leave. What happened to them? Did they buy that product in a physical store? I think back when we started Raincheck, uh, e-commerce accounted for 7.4% of total retail sales. So you know, there was a lot of hype around e-commerce, but at the end of the day, it was you know, the store sales was the big thing. So, uh, I mean, today after COVID, it may be, around 20%, maybe a bit over at this point, but um, it's not the lion's share of transactions. So we decided that the 
physical pos and payment systems at the pos combined with the e-com discovery was a big thing. And um, most retailers just assumed that that getting that data of people coming from my discovering products online and buying them in store just was impossible to get, but it's not. And then that led us into the card schemes, Visa, MasterCard, which most of the transactions go over those rails. And then we thought with CardLink services, CardLink technology, we could tokenize people's cards, put that against the user ID, and then also that's how we would tr trigger whether a transaction was made in a physical store at SKU level, not just at merchant level. So not just the merchant ID, but the actual product level, and that's what we worked on quite heavily, and there was quite a few different ways of attacking that, but auth codes is one in the, in the payload off the payment terminal. Um, but being able to actually seamlessly integrate with the POS was difficult. And once we got involved in card linking, we realised that there's um, a really cool application for loyalty, uh, putting a loyalty layer over there and making it a lot more simpler for um, smaller brands or even larger ones to actually kick off a, a loyalty program quite easily and quite fast because it was cloud-based. And then um, we basically reversed that back into distributed ledger technology to be able to make that more universal. Really cool. I mean, and you raised an interesting point as well, Cameron, which is the retailers and most sort of, you know, retail organizations um, or who deal with a the customer they have a very narrow view. You know, they, they will have them for retention at the point of sale, but any other activity they do outside of that, you know, has always been a bit of a mystery, but we're seeing this sort of air gap start to be plugged now by services like, you know, Google Analytics and those sort of trends where you can start to track a customer more effectively and provide them a more personalized experience. So forget rain check. Is that something that you guys want to look into in the future in regards to, you know, giving people the power to sort of, you know, have a more consistent retail experience across the board as well? Oh, perhaps. Um, we're actually going through a process at the moment. It's more of a reverse merger with the technology because we, we had an app at the time. And we thought, oh, you know, the rain check app would be really cool. It'll have your wish list in it. We can turn it into a wallet um, and enable people to order through the app and we fulfill the orders like a normal online process. But it's really, really expensive to market an app. It's just ridiculous. Like I think it's 4 to $10, you know, to, to onboard a user, like in costs really, once you add it up. And it's just, unless you've got millions of dollars to, to really throw behind marketing an app, I wouldn't do it anymore. There's too many. There's too many apps. They're almost like web pages now, but they're actually apps and they cost a fair bit of money to not only build but maintain. So we pulled out of that, closed the app down and went back into a platform play and, and all of the modules in the platform is the online to offline, the card link, the analytics, um, location services, all these things are in modules. So we decided let's offer that to people that have apps, whether they're a retailer or whether they're a, even a you know, neo bank might, might want to use some of the services. So that's what we did. And... There's a large travel application that picked it up and they were involved in duty-free and luxury goods and they are the ones that made a sort of a reverse merger offer to acquire the technology. But in, to answer your questions, I'm not sure whether I'd um, probably continue trying to tackle that problem in retail. Retail is a really difficult sector to work in there. Um, they're not... If you compare it with finance, finance are right on the edge of technology. Most of the new stuff, like blockchain, for example, will will enter into finance industry first, and that's where everything arrives. But when it gets to retail, it's a few years away, and, and people um, that work in retail just aren't on the ball as much. They, they seem to hang on to the legacy stuff a lot longer. Um, I, so it's really hard to innovate in that area. They're, it's just they're behind. And I think most of the people that are successful at innovating in the retail sector will end up in the finance sector, for example. Yeah, very much. And also, so with your, with your customer base and obviously you've got that back-end system or the platform structure set up, and I do agree with you, by the way, on the cost of retail and getting apps out. Uh, Carl and I know it only too well how much, how much it costs and um, the challenges with that um, moving forward. If you can avoid it, I do recommend it. But um, so are your customers, do you have international customers onto the platform versus Australian customers or what's, what's the mix look like at the moment? Oh, it's mainly um, in Australia and some in APAC as well. That's the sort of area we concentrated on. We did look at um, going further beyond that, but it's, it, you know, it's, it's probably 
I, I guess we got to the point where we had an opportunity to mer- to do this reverse merger at the time, so we just stopped doing that and entertaining any of those ideas. But the UK had some opportunities. We just it was too hard to service them at the mm-hmm. time. Okay. Well, interesting. And also, you mentioned the distributed ledger or blockchain technology uh, with it. Does that make up, is that complementary to the platform at the moment? Is that something that's going to grow and evolve in the future? Or is it, are you seeing, you know, uptake there now? Uh, not, not a lot of uptake. I, we're not pushing that at the moment. We're just still working on the technology side of it. Um, we, you, as I mentioned, you know, innovation and technology advancement in the retail sectors very slow. So talking to them about blockchain and distributed ledger just be fools, Aaron. But what we can talk about, what we do talk about is how the we can aggregate loyalty points and in, implement loyalty solutions into retail quite fast and the benefits that you can get out of it. And they'll, they'll question that and wonder how in the hell you do it, but it is the blockchain that does that. So if you can, I mean, there's quite a few loyalty solutions that are arriving now that are connected to cards. Um, you'll like... There's one from crypto.com. I don't know if you've heard of that. It's the MCO card. It's yeah. 8% cash back on everything. They'll pay your Netflix, Spotify, and Prime subscriptions every month. It just sounds too good to be true, right? But yeah. you've got to stake a million tokens of their tokens first before you can start getting up to that level. But, you know, I mean, if the more and more people that get that card and do it, then obviously the value of that token will go up. So it doesn't matter if you're staking it anyway. So... There's a lot of really cool things happening in the distributed ledger space around loyalty, except you just can't tell people about the technology because they get a bit worried about it. Mm. So we keep things at loyalty, um, user experience, points, <laughs> things they understand. You know, the point might be um, backed onto a distributed ledger, it may even be a token based thing, but you can't talk about that so they understand it. Yep. If that makes sense. Definitely. And on board. Sorry, Carl. Sorry. No, that's all right. No, I was just going to say one of the big ones. I mean, obviously, we saw Qantas start to expand their loyalty platform into multiple areas as well. I mean, do you see that's a trend that, that a lot of these large organizations are going to start to do as well, Cameron? Like, you know, to keep it simple in regards to points and, you know, benefits and tiers, but offer, I guess, a wide range of partnerships and services, you know, as part of their platform outside of their normal offering as well. Yeah, I, I have no doubt that... Um the big coalitions will reach out to uh, not just six or eight retailers in in some in one case and maybe 200 in the other one, but to thousands. Your, your local coffee shop, you'll be able to get loyalty points, uh, Qantas flight, miles, whatever it might be. They're just going to reach out. And, um, yeah, same technology scaled out a lot wider. Definitely. Is- is there any benefit, I, I guess, and obviously you're part of the uh, Northern Beaches Innovation um, you know, crew that are based out of here as well, trying to promote that community component. And I guess that raises an interesting point. You know, should those local communities then also look at doing something like that where you know, there is a loyalty system for, say, a suburb, a region where small businesses can kind of band together and create more commercial opportunities that way as well? Oh, yeah. We're, we're, we're launching a new platform early in the new year. Um, there's still a bit of negotiation to go on with the cards, firms and things, but it's going to be aimed at non-for-profits. And when I came up with the idea of doing this, I thought, no one's really doing it. And then when I spoke to a couple of people, they said there's 52,000 non-for-profits in New South Wales. And I went, you're kidding. Like, like we were talking earlier about rugby. You know, as you guys are into rugby, well, a local subbies club's a non-for-profit, right? Now, what they do is, this is an example. It could be a surf club. It could be a charity. It doesn't matter. But... They all have one thing in common. They have a vehicle, which is a non-for-profit. They have donors or they have members or supporters that all support it. Um, and they have sponsors, right? Like our surf club, Manly Surf Club here, one of their sponsors is Harris Farm. Um, not, yeah, Harris Farm. So this is a good example, right? They might have, let's say they've got 2,000 members down there um, and they've got Harris Farm as a sponsor. Normally what they do is they hit Harris Farm up every year for a cheque. They probably give them 20 grand or whatever it might be and they pound them and they finally give them the cheque and the cheque goes into the bank and then they use it to buy equipment. What this would do is by using cardling technology and loyalty and making it all seamless, all the members would just enrol their debit or credit card. What we would do is tag any of the merchant IDs from Harris Farm and it could just be the one in Manly. There's one here. So any member that makes a purchase, let's say over $5 or between $5 and $200, whatever it may be, just put some rules around it, automatically 10% of that transaction will go to the surf club or the non-for-profit. 
and that'll be paid by Harris Farm. So Harris Farm then has a tax deduction on it being a sponsorship or paid to a charity, whatever it may be. So it all happens seamlessly. And that'll probably raise 20 grand in no time and there's no, you know, there's no friction or anything. Yeah, there's no sort of expectation. And and to a degree, you're right, that's kind of happening at the moment, right? Like same with Michael, if we were, were running, you know, Linfield where you would basically have um, your meat and bar suppliers and you would basically then encourage your members to say, well, they're supporting us, so go out and support them as well. But there's no real way to track that conversion at the moment, right? That's just all word of mouth and it's, you know, it's, yes, this might happen. We might have a bit of a spike after the weekend when the boys get some beers after rugby, um, but there is no real way to track it. So this is a really interesting thing, Cameron, because that would give the opportunity for the club to sort of wield a bit of power back. So, well, guys, well, look, you know, as you can see, there's benefits to becoming a sponsor here as we can track, you know, through this platform. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, our local rugby side, um, last year there was a guy that used, we had a removalist company. They only gave us $500, but there's, there's quite a few of those little guys. And 500 bucks is good for, for them. And there's one guy that used them three times because of he saw them through the club. And he, you know, he probably spent 1500 bucks there, right? So... Yeah, you can't measure that unless you hear about it. Well, it's good. You're actually giving, you're empowering the proof and the traceability of doing it. Because I know when, when I was treasurer of Linfield, I had issues always having to prove it to the sponsors about what they spent there. And by empowering the local community to do things differently when using the tools that other the big corporates would have, in this case, the Qantas loyalty situation, you're actually creating a whole really innovative industry. That's yeah, exactly. Point. And if someone who's a member of Manly Surf Club and rolls a card and forgets about it, they might go to Harris Farm six weeks later and they might spend 100 bucks. All of a sudden, they'll get a text or something after they're, as they're walking through the car park and say, you just donated $10 to the surf club. And you go, oh, you beauty. Like, that's pretty good. <laughs> that's fantastic. And it's a good marketing situation. So you're finding, um, are you finding during the COVID situation, obviously from the start of the year to now, are you finding you've increased business or there's been more people on the platform from? Suppliers? Oh, we, we haven't launched this platform yet, but um, what we, I've been doing a lot of work during COVID on Fidel API, which is the API that it's a central API that plugs into Visa, MasterCard, Amex, and in Australia, it'll plug into FPOS Rails as well, so we can capture all the transactions. There's a lot of work in doing that. It's live in the UK, the Nordics, USA, Canada, Ireland, a few places, but I'm bringing that to the APAC region. So we'll probably launch Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, Japan, and maybe one other. So I'm working on that at the moment. That So I've been lucky because I'm doing a lot of, um, I'm, I'm sort of generating a lot of business through this is what's coming. You guys, you know, should know about it and they're really keen on finding out about it. So building that up and also obviously doing the negotiations and get everything ready to, to light up the networks and things like that. I have noticed that, well, even software, it, it, the COVID doesn't really affect it at all. Like people involved in software, as you know, can work from anywhere. It doesn't matter. You can work from your phone if you have to. But um, so it hasn't really slowed down. I think um, I, some of some things have been really good, like legal contracts, for example. Getting them done. These legal guys are at home, right? They're churning through stuff a lot quicker. <laughs> I thought that's one thing I've noticed. Usually when you get put a contract out there, you've got to wait like six weeks, but it's coming back in two. So things like that is good. Well, that's, well, at the moment, the last couple of episodes, um, Carl and I have had guests on, we're going through the skill sets, obviously building out these type of platforms. Um, in your case, you've got a little bit of blockchain thrown in there. How are you finding with, um, are you using a lot of local talent, offshore talent, a bit of a mix of both? Like how? Oh, it's a mix of both. We've got people all over the place, depending on what we need done. Um, my co-founder for the past couple of ventures, has uh, he's Chinese Australian. He's worked with me for uh, maybe almost 10 years now. So we've done a lot of projects together. Um, he's pretty much the lead. He, he, he can code anything. You know, he's a Java guy. He does Node. He can do um, uh, Xamarin, for example. He does iOS, Android. It doesn't matter. He, he can cover it all. But uh, through him and most, both of us, we know quite a few different developers all over the world. They could be in Eastern Bloc, could be in the UK, could be in Asia. And obviously in Australia as well, um, you know, Queensland, Victoria, we've got some guys in South Australia. So we're, we're pretty well covered in that area because we've done a lot of work um, building systems over the years um, and, and designers as well in, in some respects. Uh, good UX, UI guys, they're, they're always just as important. Um, 
pretty hard to nail down sometimes because they um, tend to work on one project at a time for obvious reasons, but some of the developers can run multiple projects. They might be doing a few at once. So, um, I've, yeah, they're, they're all over the place, really. That's quite interesting because that's what, what we found is when we're doing some work is Eastern European markets has been something I've used a lot of at the moment. Um, so with, with the platform, obviously, you're going to be creating and bringing in lots of data in the future too. So you're processing a lot of that from a, um, artificial intelligence or maybe an analytics perspective. Is that something you're planning for now or, or do you have that already set up for how you handle that? Oh, well, we've done it before. We've Most of our stuff's all on AWS. Um, Will, who's my co-founder, he's been doing a lot of work on um, machine learning, which is AI, obviously, but machine learning is the main part of it. Um, using, he's run some things off TensorFlow and, and things like that, which is quite a handy um, place to go. Uh, but, yeah, mainly all on AWS. We, don't, we haven't really got any data warehousing happening or anything like that yet. We sometimes use some third-party tools on the dashboard side. Uh, like Grow, we've used Grow before. I don't know if you know Grow. Yep. Grow out of the US. That, 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 that worked well for us on the Rain Check platform. That's awesome. So one of the things um, we obviously said earlier, um, Cameron, which is quite interesting, is you're moving away from the sort of mobile apps because the cost of, you know, acquisition is quite high. So for people who are, I guess, starting out and, you know, following the full steps of, you know, entrepreneurial technologists like yourself, um, you know, are there any words of advice on the way that should they, you know, be prototyping things first? Should they be looking at the overall costs of acquisition when they're looking at solutions as well um, and, and factoring that into their cost model? What are some of the things that you, you can recommend when they're starting out? Um, well, most of the, okay, let's say you've got, if trying to solve a problem, which is usually the way it starts, um, and you come up with an idea to solve the problem, then work out, you know, try and work out from, the user experience and, and come backwards from there. So what, what is the user, who's the user and um, what are they going to want to see and how are they going to want to see it and then come back from there. And then I think that what I do is go and find out what a APIs are available from whoever's got them, whether they're open source or, or not. You'll find that most solutions you can probably knock over with two or three APIs, just sort of blending them together. It's a little bit like cooking something and you can create another solution, right? That's one way. The only problem with that is that there's going to be costs involved in utilising those APIs and you're sort of reliant on them surviving or being around as well. So, But you can put a good MVP together using other people's tech, if you like, and then just show it to someone and say, you know, you know this is crazy, you know, I'd definitely pay for this. And then just try and build your own stuff from there, but don't go out and build that at the time. Don't start building things until you've sold it pretty much, I think, is my best advice because the whole thing moves, right? Like it could be a problem now and then you start working on it and after 20 months, you know, you've gone through some iterations, you've got a few people that like it and then the whole thing shifts. There's something else has tackled that problem that's massive or, or you know, that happens a lot. So, um, yeah, but, but specifically on mobile, it depends. I think there's... Um, well, you know, Google and Apple, you know, just control the app world, right? And there's a lot of pressure on them at the moment from some people you may have read that have just said, I'm not paying you 30% anymore, you can get stuff. So there's a lot of pressure on them. There's, uh, you know, SMS is still quite cool. I think um, there's a lot of good tech around mobile now that doesn't require a native app. There's a new message format called, um, I think it's RSA, I can't remember what it is. It's a rich... Yes, it's the next version of SMS, if you like, and it's quite rich, rich and interactive and quite quick. Most, you know, once we've got 4G, 5G, then native apps won't have as, as much of a, um, I mean, you know, native apps have a lot of an advantage over web, mobile web, but it's getting thinner and thinner, which is great because it just means you can launch, you know, sort of containers that are web-based things instead of like going through the app store, if you like. You know, they'll argue that the app store is there because it's discoverable. People discover apps there. Well, that's 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 not so true anymore. There's too many apps. There's, I'll give you an example. Have you ever gone to install an app and realised you already had it? Yep, absolutely. Thanks. And the, the interesting thing was actually I, I read a really interesting article um, and a research which was basically. Oh, so Michael, I'll throw this to you. How many times do you reckon on average someone checks their phone per day? Oh, gee whiz. 
those stats have been varying, but I would say I've seen stats of, I'm not joking, of 2,000 with the clips with the eye movements and the numbers coming up. So you need, there's 150 unique sessions per day, which is basically you picking your phone up, doing something with it, locking it right. and putting it back down on average, right? And to your point, Cameron, what people were saying was that creates this fickle nature where people have tried to create apps to cater to that attention span with, you know, doing unique things. But in reality, 50% of those apps have been created uh, realistically just HTML5 with, you know, native code wrapped around it and dumped onto the app store and serve no purpose after two months. You know, that's basically the average shelf life as well. So that's, I mean, that's an interesting mobile way to look at it. But I mean, is that attention span you can also see carrying across to things like, you know, your solution with RainCheck? Is it really hard to keep those customers engaged for, you know, a long period of time and, and make changes as well to keep them on the hook? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, in the Western world, we operate completely different than, let's say, China. But China's, what they've done is they've built platforms on top of apps, right? Mm -hmm. So there's an app that does everything, you know. It'll do your banking, it'll lend you money, it'll do your social stuff. It's all, you're all in the same app, right? That just does everything. Whereas we have an app for everything, supposedly. And I think that, yeah, definitely. I, I mean, HTML5 especially, um, just little, like, let's have a look in the last few months, um, especially in Sydney, because we're allowed to go out and do things. Everyone knows what a QR code is now and they know exactly what to do when they see one. So that, that's a big game changer as well because QR code solves the discoverability thing. I might be at a point of sale and I'll, there's, um, someone might say, get cash back or get some reward points on this purchase you're doing. Just, they're going to scan the code, right? Eight months ago, they'd stand there. Most people in Australia staring at you. I wonder what that thing does. Is it a crossword puzzle? What is it? So it's just things that change and make people realise what else they can do with their phones. And, and that, that QR code could do anything, right? It could launch one of these little tiny applets or it could... Yeah, it can send you to the app store or it could actually actually do, carry out a transaction. There's a lot of things that they can do. So I think that's really good because they're obviously big in China and generally Asia, but never really picked up here, although they've been here for a long time. Mm. Very much. And also, like, one thing that's with your experience, you've gone the platform route, which is, as you mentioned, not gone down the app route, which a lot of people do. Um, we're on a podcast earlier and, or looking at um, how when you, I went to StarCon, I think a couple of years back, and all I could see was apps, like running apps, health apps, gym apps, you name it, they're all there. But you've, you've obviously come from a lot of other exiting of other businesses in the past. Is that what you've taken your experience from, from those businesses and applied it to this open platform so you can go forward strategically without having to really worry yeah. about apps? Yeah, definitely. I'll be quite frank. I mean, the most expensive thing, you can spend your money on in a tech startup or any venture really is people. They're bloody expensive, right? Um, especially if you hire them full time. So, you know, we'll always contract people as long as we can because it's just so expensive in this country to hire someone full time and it's, you know, it's almost impossible to, you know, dehire them if you like, <laughs> if you have to. So people are really expensive. So, yeah, I think um, we decided that we realised that some of the apps that we built, we'd have to build a lot of um, back-end services and APIs and everything to, to, to feed the app. And then it's not that hard even to bring legacy systems in and have a middleware layer or something like that to pull other data. So once we built this infrastructure to, to power an app, it's like, well, other people could use this to power their apps, right? They, don't, they could come to us and <laughs> build an app out off the platform that might do similar things and just change the, the interface and everything and, um, that's a lot cheaper way of, for them to go. And um, the, it was a model that was around in the early days of native apps. There was a, quite a few platforms. Even Facebook had one. They don't exist anymore. And I think that um, the platform plays a lot, of, uh, a lot easier because you've got a dev team, you've got a few other people, you know, doing stuff, this UX, UI, this testing. There's the normal functions of building stuff, but you don't have the customer service guys, the marketing guys, the sales guys. There's not as much of that that you need, but you do with an app. You need mm. social media people. There's a lot of things you need to acquire users and look after the users and keep them engaged and keep them using the app. And that's what, you know, this is what Facebook and these guys do every day. And they've got, they got you know, armies of people doing this. 
Very much. And also, like, from your experience, obviously, with the innovation side, um, where, where do you think Australia can improve or what other challenges in Australia to, you know, build out the innovation and get it growing and underpinning the economy from what you're seeing? Oh, I think it's a really good place. I mean, it's um, – I've said this a lot. Australia's only got 25 million, but it's got the same population as Texas, right? Mm. So if you, went, if you went to a VC and said, I've got this idea, it's, you know, it does these unreal things, you – it's going to be fantastic. And I said, what's your market? You say, oh, it's Texas. You know, you're not going to get funded, are you? But the rest of the world looks at Australia as Texas. Well, you know, not Texas, but it's a very small market. But what it is, is it's very advanced. The, there's people down here, there might only be 25 million people that live here, but the people that are here all have smartphones. The unemployment rate is quite low compared to the rest of the world. The telecommunications networks are really advanced. Um the payment system is, is really advanced. I mean, it was only like a year ago I was down at Manly with a, a bunch of American guys that had come out and I bought them all a beer and I just tapped my card and took off. And one of the guys said, what did you just do then? I said, I just bought the, paid for the beers. And they said, you're kidding. And they, he wanted to go next time when I did it to see what happened. It's, they just don't have that. <laughs> they, they're starting to have it now, but it's just not prevalent like it is here. So the payment, plat- or the payment systems that we have here, we've got NPP. MPP, you know, because I'm obviously on to all of this stuff, but my son, he's 26. And I said, what's your pay ID? And he goes, what's that? <laughs> well, I said, you're 26, you should know this stuff. Anyway, um, you know, it's just obviously a mobile number. You can send money to everyone. Most young people are onto it, but um, it's just, you know, the US are just talking about Fed now, which is their version of it. Like, it'll probably be years before they launch it. And we've got that here now. And I think later on next year that you'll be able to, do some really cool things with small businesses and even larger businesses as well in paying things. So it's quite exciting. That's truly true. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I think you're right. Like it's, it's a very good test market. Like it's a good asset test for technology here because like you said, the banks, especially in the big four are probably very advanced compared to the U S and, and um, European counterparts, which are, you know, all banks are kind of seen as, you know, risk adverse, but here there's been a lot of investment in technology um, including you know, most of the banks also running their own you know, trading platforms. Um, again, Michael, I think we spoke about this the other day. They're also looking at cryptocurrency. They have projects, all four banks, I believe, at the moment have projects looking at cryptocurrency as well and the viability. So um, I guess it's just, it, it is really, it's a bit of a scale problem though, isn't it, Cameron, when you're trying to build something and there's just not level to the access of funding that you do have you know, from Europe or, or the US. Yeah, no, definitely. You get, as, as you said, there's a really good market to launch a product because if it works here, it's going to work in most, like it's going to work in the UK, it's going to work in the US, it's going to work in quite a few markets. But what you want to do is get it working here, um, you know, just verify a few things and then get out of here. You've got to go, just leave, get, go to the US, go straight over there. If you want to scale globally, otherwise you can't, otherwise you can just get stuck here and you'll reach a plateau and that'll be it. Very much. And have you have you found you've had some challenges with investment in Australia, like for the for the idea or in the past? Or yeah, yeah. There's always a challenge. I think um, most of most VCs won't take too much of a risk here. They'll say, "Are you doing a hundred thousand a month?" And yeah, we're interested. I'm thinking if I'm doing a hundred thousand a month, I wouldn't be asking for money. You know, but mm. it's sort of there's a there's a tipping point there. Um, I mean, people in Australia celebrate getting funded, but. I don't think it's a celebration thing, but <laughs> oh, we've just given away twenty percent of our company. I don't think it's a that much of a celebration thing. I think it does mean you've got some runway, more runway. But um, you know that some of the really good ventures that have got off the ground, some of them have done it with no money, no VC funding, and I guess that's the main aim. And then if you have to take a bit of seed capital, make sure you get as far down the, the runway as you can with that, whether it's five hundred k or two hundred k of seed funding. Just work out how to get that you know, out to a year, year and a half, whatever it may be. And then hopefully you're getting paid customers. That's great. And then bootstrap. So bootstrap as long as you can hold on to that equity, yeah? Is it early enough? Well, it, 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 it does depend because some, some, in some cases you need to, depending on the idea or what problem you're solving, sometimes you need to get it to market or you need to scale faster than in other ideas. So I think in those cases, because if you don't, you're going to lose. So then you might want to get some seed or series A or some sort of funding once you start going into the sales mode just to give you that kick along I think no definitely definitely so what's um what's the next so obviously launching the platform 
in the, in the new year kind of or in anger or is it just more of a light touch soft launch or how are you going there uh yeah it'll be okay the, the it's a cash pack exchange the main platform but off that will be a non-for-profit part for as i as i spoke to you guys about but there'll be another one where you'll be able to get your cash back and disperse it anywhere you want off your phone bill off your mortgage off whatever utilities bill you've got so you basically just set it to where you want the cash to go and off it goes um so that's one idea we're working on there's another one which has been around for quite some time on um, probate on using distributed ledger for probate which basically i mean you go down to the pub and speak to any bloke and say you know have you got a sports bet account yeah have you got a <laughs> they've got all these accounts, right, with funds in them sitting there. If they were hit by a bus, no one in no one had any idea that they had any of these funds. So we wanted to basically use distributed ledger and private keys to be able to put that in a will so that the family can access all of that stuff. And I've worked with state government on around that, around legislation that they're trying to change. Um, you know, and that can be quite disruptive, I think. That's very... Because the state government even said, you know, like we wouldn't allow that because the legislation doesn't cover that. I said, I don't, I don't need any legislation for me to sign up to a service that does that for me. And they went, yeah, well, you're probably right. So, but it would be good if they had the buy-in. That's all. But I don't know if you ever work with the government. <laughs> <laughs> so, and and is that and obviously I know I probably didn't mention it earlier, but are you looking to build that on the Stella? blockchain is that what you mentioned a lot of your technology or is that different blockchain um, we're not sure on that one the stellar protocol we we selected for um well, most things because it's the guys at stellar development foundation they they just keep their heads down and they don't talk about too much stuff they just really get into building stuff and um we looked at their protocol and, and their network and the horizon core and we just decided that it was the way to go it's um it, it uses a federated FBT, like Byzantine Federated way of reaching consensus. And consensus is everything on blockchains. This is why Bitcoin has a problem and obviously Ethereum because they're on proof of work. They can't scale. You can't, you'll never be able to pay for something on Bitcoin. It's just not going to happen. So Ethereum is obviously going through this major Ethereum 2 thing, which is phase zero, it keeps getting put back, but maybe out by December, which is the first phase. Um, and they've got roll-ups and things happening now. It's, I, it's, I think it's a bit of a, I don't know, it turns out you talked about, I think it's a bit of a mess. I'm not sure how far they're going to go with it. I'm not even sure if they're going to pull it off because getting trying to get from proof of work to proof of stake is they're effectively rebuilding Ethereum. Yeah. So it's going to be interesting to watch. But, yeah, Stellar was what we chose. The, it has everything you need, the fast transactions, very scalable, and um, it does have smart contracts. They're quite simple. They're not as... Don't, like if you're into decentralized finance, obviously some of the contracts might be, need to be, um, you know, quite complex. But we don't. Not in uh, well, not in loyalty, and obviously probably not in probate either. Yeah, oh, very much. And look, secure government and security is a big one, you know, with that at the moment. So obviously, getting past those protocols and the requirements that they need to get up and running, um, you'll be first there. At least you can sit at the table and influence policy. <laughs> <laughs> It's a dream, eh? Well, wonderful. Well, Cameron, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on today. Um, and, you know, it's been really interesting hearing your insights in regards to, you know, loyalty, finance, um, as well as Bitcoin. And I think Michael might try and get away with one podcast without talking about that one, but we'll see. Um, but on behalf of myself and Michael, I just wanted to thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, we'll be putting, as per usual, all the Cameron's details, including what they've been up to, as well as rain checks details uh, in the synopsis after the show. Um, so feel free to have a look and look at some of the exciting projects that are happening within Aussie tech as well. So Cameron, thank you very much. Yeah, no worries. Thanks very much for having me on and hopefully we can, uh, have a beer one day soon. Looking forward to it. Absolutely. See you later. Wonderful. Cheers. Thanks guys. See you guys. Bye.